welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us um, for the afternoon session uh, after what has been a really uh, thought-provoking morning. Um, so welcome back. I'm pleased to introduce David Orton, who is a senior lecturer in zooarchaeology at York. Um, he's got wide-ranging uh, research uh, that stretches from the medieval period, uh, or from the Neolithic to the medieval period. Um, Dave is also a principal investigator on the Raxus project, which we're very lucky to hear about today. So, thank you, David. Thank you. So, I feel like a little bit of an interloper here, although not quite as much as I did when I wrote that introduction yesterday. It's been quite nice to see this is how broad the group of people here today is. Um, I am not an expert on the first wave pandemic. I'm not even really a specialist in plague studies, but I do know quite a lot about the archaeology of rats, which is, of course, potentially quite relevant in this context. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And in fact, I'm going to do two quite different things with this talk. The first half, I want to introduce the major new project on rats um, that Andrew mentioned, and run through kind of some of the key themes and questions chronologically from the the late prehistoric start to a uh, post-medieval end, so that the frame of that project. Um, and secondly, I want to present a specific study of late antique rats from England and Italy, and a little bit from Iberia as well, um, which is nearing the publication stage, and which hopefully will be of particular interest to the audience here today. Um, so the Rattus project, first of all. Rattus is a five-year project. It was originally an ERC project in the same cool as Helen's that we heard about earlier, but whereas she decided, probably very sensibly, to move hers out of the country in order to keep the EU money, I instead took the British government's um, backup money and have stayed in York with it. Partly because it meant I could keep the whole team in one place, which is going to be nice. Um, so, so the, the overall aim here, the overall aim here, is to understand the intertwined history of rats and humans across Europe over the past two and a half thousand years, or so. The beginning of the time frame remains to be seen. That's one of the first questions. Um, so it's a little bit ambitious in that sense. The scope is very, very broad, which means it is inevitably going to be one of those very archaeological projects where there are big, broad brush issues and large maps and long time frames that may not resonate all that well with quite a lot of historians who obviously tend to be working with the much more particular, in time in particular. Um, but that's archaeology and that's kind of where we, where we are typically. Um, so we have four overall objectives here. The first is to document the dispersal of rats into Europe and their changing distribution through time. So basically the biogeography of rats. This is the kind of the essential backdrop to anything else you might want to do with them, really. Um, secondly, we want to understand the factors behind this, and particularly how dependent rats were on humans in different times and places, um, so human settlements, human communications, and so on. Thirdly, we want to flip that round to use rats as a kind of proxy for broad-scale human economic trends. So particularly um, kind of late antique into early medieval, but potentially also beyond that. Um, finally, most relevant for today, we want to assess the role of rats in past disease, by which we primarily mean plague. Um, as you probably expect for a kind of big archaeological project like this, it has one of these slides where I have lots of headshots showing who's doing what. And we have a range of different methods involved. So it is based firmly in zooarchaeology. Um, I won't go through the people, you can read them. But it's based firmly in zooarchaeology. We will be looking at a lot of different rat bones, some of them checking previously published things, sometimes just compiling published data, and sometimes going out and seeking new specimens from areas where there isn't currently much data. Um, we will then also be doing quite a considerable amount of ancient DNA work on those bones. We'll also be doing some work with stable isotopes, um, which is a little bit more niche within the overall project that I'll mention a couple of times later on. Um, and finally, there's a method called zooms, which the archaeologists in the room will probably be very familiar with, but the rest of you might not. This is an incredibly useful, low-cost, minimally destructive identification method uh, using proteins, which very fortunately allows you to distinguish not only rats from other species, but black rat from brown rat. It means we can basically take a tiny, tiny bit of bone check the ID before we waste time and waste bone on doing genetics or isotopes or anything else, or perhaps just the or greater carbon data for that matter. Um, we will also have a couple of uh, other specialists from outside my department involved in this. We will be doing a fairly bounded uh, historical study looking at written sources relating to the arrival of brown rats and their replacement of black rats in Northwest Europe with my colleague Mark Jenner. 
and he'll have a PhD student working with him. And we will also have a postdoc working with Penn Holland in biology on ecological modeling in the last couple of years of the project. So taking a lot of the data we've generated through the other strands and trying to actually model the systems that are underlying that. That's hopefully when everything will all come together. We'll see. Um, so, okay, so these four objectives obviously play out across a series of more specific chronological objectives. So I'm going to kind of run through some examples fairly informally through space and time. Um, and this starts with the original spread of rats to Europe. Now, most of you in the audience will probably be well aware of the broad picture here, so apologize, apologies to anyone I'm patronizing here, but for the uninitiated, it's worth going back to the basics for a moment. So the rats that we're all familiar with today in temperate Europe, hopefully not too familiar, are brown rats, these guys, Ratus norvegicus. Um, these originated probably in Northeast Asia. It's actually not entirely certain. It's very hard to find out where a globally distributed species originally came from, turns out. Um, but probably from Northern China, Southeast Siberia, parts of Mongolia, possibly also Japan, that's debated. Um, it didn't reach Europe until probably the 18th century. We're going to look into that. I'll say a bit more about that later, but that probably broad time frame is correct. Um, prior to this, we are, of course, looking at the black rat, Ratus ratus. And this is the species, of course, that gets argued about in the context of the second plague pandemic in particular, and also to some extent in the context of the first plague pandemic. So most of the time when I say rats, this is what I mean. I'll be specific when I'm talking about brown rats. No. So, black rats actually come from Southern Asia. Modern genetics has shown that it's the lineage or subspecies or species, depending on who you ask, from the Indian subcontinent that's spread worldwide. There is another lineage or subspecies or species in Southeast Asia, which is uh, spread into some parts of, um, uh, well, some spread into Ireland, Southeast Asia, but not really to the rest of the world. So, Basically, the area shaded here is where they spread to the world from. But that modern genetics doesn't tell us anything about the timing of that process. Um, and there are some theories out there. So one theory, there we go. one theory is that they first <coughs> colonized human settlements in probably the Indus Valley, about 3rd millennium BC, and spread quite rapidly to Mesopotamia, where again you have early urbanism, lots of trade between the two regions. Um, and at some point after that, spread by overland trade routes into the eastern Mediterranean, to the Levant, basically. Um, I know quite a few people who work on this kind of period who think this sounds very likely. There's no real evidence for it, except that we start to see, towards the end of the second millennium BC, some reported finds of rats around the eastern Mediterranean. Okay. None of those have ever been confirmed as yet. The kind of rival theory is that it's a much later process, maybe Ptolemaic, maybe even early Roman, depending on who you ask, involving Red Sea trade. Um, and they probably were already actually around the Persian Gulf, but that the eventual spread to the Mediterranean was mainly maritime. Um, I have no idea which of these is correct. We're going to try and look into it, kind of. We're probably not going to sample from this area. It's quite difficult in terms of preservation and access, um, but we'll try and fix the dates in the Mediterranean at least. Just as kind of, for the sake of completeness, I should say that we actually do know much more about spread along the East African coast. A paper by Prendergast et al. in 20. 17, not to say, um, showed that you start to find it in certain places like Zanzibar around 500 or so CE, and then by the 9th century, you're getting them in South Africa and in Madagascar and the rest of this history, really. Um, but it seems that the spread to the Mediterranean happened before that because we know that they were present by the Roman period. This is well established, and I'll talk about this. Um, what we are going to do is try and hunt down some of the few cases, and these are the ones that um, were most likely to be something in the short term. Some of the few cases of pre-Roman rats that are relatively convincing from the literature, and check them out, check that they really are rats, check the radio carbon dating as well. So no pre-Roman rats, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world, with the exception of some that we haven't yet published that we have, have been either molecularly ID or radiocarbon dated. So basically our knowledge, when it comes to our knowledge on a firm basis, starts with the Roman period. So we can try and actually see how much earlier are they turning up. There are some kind of second century BC funds from Corsica, but they weren't directly taken. Um, okay, so by the Roman period, um, I've run out of my notes. Okay. Yeah, so what is, what is well established is that by the Roman period, uh, rats are widespread across Europe. And in fact, if you plot them out, as I've done here, 
Then we basically have a map of the Roman Empire, with very few exceptions. Um, there's a very similar map, in fact, in Kyle's book, but not quite all the same points, but we've both drawn heavily on Mike McCormick's database and then added to it. So unsurprisingly, we've ended up with very similar maps. Um, so what's behind this distribution? Well, the easy answer would be something like rats thrive in cities and the Romans have cities. But of course, it's more complicated than that. So rats are also found in villa sites quite often, also military sites, including some quite small ones. So we're potentially talking about smaller sites, but well-connected smaller sites. And I suspect what we're seeing here is dependence on the Roman economic system as a whole. Um, it's a combination of large, dense hubs, but also regular bulk movement of perishable goods between those hubs, and indeed between those hubs and some types of smaller settlement as well. Now, much the same has been said before by people like Mike McCormick in particular, and it makes a lot of intuitive sense. We want to step a little bit further in modeling this systematically, mapping out rat finds by settlement type across the region, uh, assessing connectivity between areas with ADNA, um, looking at different dietary niches in different settlement types and different regions using isotopes, and most importantly, really building population models of the whole system to understand which factors were most crucial for sustaining rat populations over the long term. Now, realistically, here we cannot model the entire of Europe. What we can do is build models which start to approach in complexity the real situation, still quite a distance off, but start to approach it. Um, and then we can play around with those and see what kinds of facts, what kinds of changes you see if you change certain factors. If you reduce the amount of trade, what effect does that have? If you knock out the big settlements or shrink them, what effect does that have? So the idea here isn't to reconstruct the whole system. The idea here is to model the whole system so that we start to understand which variables have what kind of impact. Now, this is important um, for understanding what happens when the system starts to break down, or if you prefer, is reconfigured um, at the end of the Roman period. Now, I won't say much about this now, as it's kind of the subject of the second part of the talk, the backdrop to the second part of the talk, so I'll skip over this for now. But suffice to say that there is, in fact, a um, marked decline in evidence for rats in post roman context in various parts, of everywhere, everywhere anybody's looked at it, basically, within the Roman world. This is well established in the literature, uh, although the timing of it needs to be resolved, and there's not too much detail out there in the literature, um, as I'll argue later on. So. To follow on from this, a recent genetic study that I was involved in, working with colleagues in Jena and in Oxford, does seem to back this up. Um, we showed that Roman rats across temperate Europe were very closely related to each other and were almost completely replaced by a new population in the medieval period, probably from a very similar original source, if you kind of trace these back and see where they branch off from each other. Um, there is some evidence for a uh, limited admixture from Western European Roman rats into medieval populations, so this isn't a complete replacement, but it's pretty close to complete. And we are really clearly looking at two waves of expansion up into northern Europe, uh, or north of the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean itself, there seems to be much more variability, much more complexity, as you would expect, given that we assume rats have been there for longer. Um, and we really need much more data to get a handle on it. You can see how little data we have in the southern third of this plot. Um, so that's something we'll be trying to do. Now, this leads on to another key question, which is when and how did rats repopulate northern Europe? Some of the earliest reported medieval finds are actually surprisingly far north. So we have places like the Viking Age trading sites at Birka in Sweden, at Hellebu or Haifabu in northern Germany, and for that matter in anglo Scandinavian York. Um, all of these dated to most likely the mid 9th century, although with varying degrees of precision. These finds emphasize the importance of the Northern Emporia, a network of trading settlements around the North Sea and the Baltic uh, coasts that have been developing since at least the 8th century. But what was it that changed in the mid-9th century and allowed rats to colonize key nodes in this system? Uh, possibly their increasing size and urban character, but we also need to think about connections to other regions. So to just kind of put a couple of hypotheses on the table, as it were, um, did rats reach the North Sea through the expanding Carolingian Empire? Kind of connections that Mike McCormick's written quite a lot about. Um, reconnecting the North Sea with the Western Mediterranean and then spread east into the Baltic. Or alternatively, or perhaps complementarily, these are not mutually exclusive, uh, did they first reach the Baltic via the early Russian river trade with the Byzantine and the Islamic worlds and then spread west to the North Sea? Right now, the, we have tentative evidence from the genetics that is pointing towards option one here. 
but we can't rule out option two as an additional or alternative model as well. Um, okay. So yeah, we'll, we'll be assessing these hypotheses, which as I say, are not mutually exclusive, building on the previous genetic study, and also by focus, focusing zoological attention in regions such as the Eastern Baltic, uh, which currently have very little published data. Well, it's not that there isn't, not necessarily that there aren't rats, but it's that people haven't looked very much at rodents from historical periods. Um, we're also working with closely with Ukrainian colleagues to the same for the same kind of reason. Um, so, rats start appearing again from the 9th century. They remain quite rare through the 10th and 11th centuries, but by the 12th and certainly by the 13th century, they are widespread across Europe. And it's of course against this backdrop that the Black Death affected the continent in the 14th century. Now, I won't rehearse the arguments for and against the role of rats in the second plague pandemic in any detail here, because I suspect they're probably quite well known to this audience. Uh, but suffice to say that doubts have been cast on, amongst other things, the distribution of rats, especially in the far north, and their presence or absence in rural areas, so beyond major towns, major ports, and so on. Um, we want to inform this debate by a better understanding of the rat populations themselves. And I should say there are other arguments that are used to favour other mechanisms apart from rats in addition to this. But those are things that we can't really address with our research. Uh, things about the, the viability of human rights as a mechanism isn't something that I'm ever going to be addressing. But I can address the viability of rats. Okay. Um, yeah, so we want to inform this debate by a better understanding. We'll systematically compile data from across the continent, not just where rats are present, but also where they aren't present, but other small mammal species are reported, so we know it's not about research bias. That could be particularly useful when looking at urban versus rural contexts, uh, people often say there's no evidence from rural sites. That may very well be true, but there's actually not that much research in most regions on large-scale excavations in rural sites. There aren't that many large-scale excavations. So we'll assess whether that's a research bias or not. Um, and we'll also use the same suite of methods. Uh, we'll also use the same suite of methods I mentioned earlier in the context of the Roman system to try to move beyond points on maps like this. I mean, we're going to try and fill out this map and make it more useful and put more points on it. But we also want to move beyond that and to start to understand the actual population dynamics of rats in broad terms. How stable are they through time? How much connectivity is there between regions? Do we see kind of local extirpations and replacements, or do we see continuous populations in different regions through time? Um, we also look for evidence of the impact of plague on the rats themselves, um, both both in terms of you know, both by genetics and by looking at the numbers in different places, patterns through time. Um, I should say that I'm going into this with a fairly open mind. I've had a run-in with at least one senior retired second plague pandemic expert who assumed I must be on the other side because I didn't seem to have an agenda. It must be an insidious person who disagrees with him. But actually, I really am going into this with an open mind. And um, my starting point is that we know that rats can spread plague. We know that they were present in many of the places hit by plague. So it seems to me very unlikely that they didn't play a role. There is a caveat to that. And anyone who knows what the caveat to that is can point it out to me later. Um, but the question for me then is where, where we should be thinking on a spectrum from a critical and universal role to a local aggravating factor in some places and not others. And I have no idea what the answer to that question is at the moment, but I think we have to be on that spectrum. We can't, I think, with that one caveat, be at a point where rats are just in irrelevance. Okay. Because we know that they are present in all these places. Um, Okay, so a final topic for rats is about how black rats' dominance in Europe came to an end. And we'll use, again, a whole range of techniques, zooarchaeology, zooms, radiocarbon dating, genetics, and written sources, most importantly, probably written sources in this case, uh, to chart the spread of brown rats. Now, the received wisdom in the zoological literature, at least the Anglophone and I think also Francophone zoological literature, it's mixed in the German literature, um, goes something like this on the picture. A spread from the source region to Eastern Europe through Russia and or Central Asia, because everything came from the East, right? Um, this doesn't hold up if you look at 18th and 19th century natural historical sources, or indeed if you read anything in Russian at all. Um, and in fact, we may, and this is quite speculative, be looking at something more like this. We have fairly good 18th century evidence for a Caucasian route, by no means conclusive, but fairly good. Uh, the rest is speculative, although it fits the very limited modern genetic data quite well. 
Um, anybody here who has expertise on that entire tranche of South Asia in this period, feel free to talk to me because I'd love to know who I should be asking about the kind of plausibility of this. Um, the spread south in the 13th century is based on genetic data, which you can see is molecular fault, so it comes with a huge health warning. Um, the question mark there for the Iranian plateau is because that is not an easy area for a species that is good in damp conditions to spread across. Um, that middle arrow could probably be a bit further north. Who knows? But the point is, not almost certainly not through the arid regions of regions of Central Asia or through southern Siberia for that matter. Um, alternatively, or perhaps additionally, a maritime spread directly to Western Europe with colonial shipping is also very much possible. So we'll be trying to kind of assess whether either or both of these might actually be what happened. Now, why is all this important? Um, apart from the fact that I have a really geeky interest in it and find it inherently interesting that we can know so little about such a recent dispersal of such a familiar species that all the textbooks think they know about, and in fact it just vanishes. All the sources that all things the stories that get cited in the textbooks just disappear when you actually look at them too closely, and we really don't actually know, which is inherently fascinating, right? But it's also important for the story of black rats. Um, if we want to understand the ecology of black rats during the second plague pandemic, then it's obviously useful to understand how that was affected by subsequent arrival of brown rats, because all our scientific observations of European black rats come from after that period. Okay, so how, how much, and can we start to understand what changed and maybe reconstruct back from that? Um, for that matter, there is the old and currently very unpopular theory that the impact of brown rats may have played some role in the disappearance of plague from the continent. Um, and perhaps there may be some merit in that, although I would imagine it could not be as simple as new species comes along and pushes out the old one and everything gets less. But it is a major change in the rodent ecology of um, human landscapes, so it may well have some kind of role in that process. Okay, so we'll explore this via, well, firstly from texts, some examples here from natural history literature. And the reason I have this is because I, as a, an archaeologist, not a historian, can excessively get into the early natural history literature and at least make superficial readings of it. We will have a PhD student, as I mentioned earlier, who will be able to give these a much more critical reading, and will also be able to access less accessible types of source, agricultural records, urban records, and so on, that I wouldn't know where to start looking for. So the idea is you can actually try to um, make some sense of what changes might really be happening in and where, where the authors are actually writing and what kind of environments would they be familiar with and so on. And how much of the stories that we see across Europe are actually people, again, a literary tropes of people repeating the same stories, because there's certainly some of that in this context. Um, okay, we will also um, we will also try to use ADNA to this end, see if we can see kind of population fragmentation of black rats, um, and also stable isotopes to look at um, whether we see shifts or narrowing of the dietary niches of black rats in response to competition from the new species. All right, and that's the end of my run through of what the project's all about. So it's a bit of a whistle stop tour. It's a lot of different questions in different periods. And it's I've more or less just strung a, little, a load of things that I'm really interested in together and made it into a earlier project. So hopefully that works as an approach. Um, okay, so moving on to the second part. This is an in progress study along with a number of collaborators who are listed here. It will be on the eventual paper if you get around to writing it. Um, and the starting point here is that post-Roman decline in rats that I mentioned earlier. This is, of course, well established in the literature, but not explored in that much detail. Um, its causes are debated. So you can put up, a, put up a couple of quotes here. Firstly, a couple of plots showing that this does happen in different places, England above, Italy below, from different sources. Um, Robin Fleming, writing recently about England, links it very clearly to changes in the movement and storage of brain um, into the 5th century. Uh, Mike McCormick, in his classic paper, is the person who was really looking most about this in the past, was a little bit more circumspect, perhaps because he was writing about a much larger region. Um, he mentions slackening communications, but also declining urbanism, climate, and indeed plague. So there are a number of a number of issues that we can highlight with this phenomenon. Firstly, we have this range of possible causes, all of which are potentially interrelated, to make life more complicated. Um, secondly, the timing needs to be refined. So when precisely did this happen? Post-Roman is an easy thing to say, but post-Roman means a different thing if you're in England or if you're in Italy or if you're in the US. Um, do we see, and for that matter, even if you're in any one of those places, different people will disagree on what you mean by that. 
Um, do we see regional differences reflecting different economic trajectories? Or is it more uniform, as might be expected if driven primarily by plague, and arguably as might be expected if driven primarily by climate, although from the debate earlier, of course, climatic factors are going to play out very differently in different places. Um, and this leads on to the third point, which is that, are these in the right order? Oh, I put these the wrong way around. This leads on to the fourth point, and I'll come back to the third. So it leads on to the fourth point, which is that if the decline in rats was already underway in the fifth century in the Northwest provinces, does this cause problems for our understanding of the mechanisms of the transmission of the first plague pandemic, now that it's conclusively clear that it did reach places like England? <coughs> um, finally, we have this question of research bias. So it's been suggested, notably by uh, Benedictov, when he's actually talking about, he's actually talking about this in the context of arguing that rats would have been present in rural settlements in the second plague pandemic, but he refers back to um, places like Anglo-Saxon England as places that didn't really have urban settlements in his understanding, and therefore, if they had rats, then why shouldn't they be in rural settlements later on? So that's the context of him making this argument. But he and a few other people have made the case that maybe this apparent absence is actually just a research bias. People simply haven't done as much excavation in post-Roman periods, or at least haven't done as much detailed sieving and recovery and reporting of small mammal bones. So that's something that needs to be checked out. Um, and again, that could play out differently in different regions. So the approach that we've taken here, um, screen, okay. the approach that we've taken here, this is where my notes run out, and I'm onto that thing completely. The approach that we've taken here is to, this is just the initial step. This started off before I knew I had funding to do this stuff on a big scale, so it's been done kind of just working from the literature. Compiled a database of site phases with rat finds. Got 161 records from England, 70 from Italy, and I'll let you read the rest. Um, each one by record here, I mean a site phase that has at least one rat. It might have 200. Okay? It's not the number of rat bones, which can vary with all kinds of taphonomic factors. It's that, that you have a site phase that has been in it. Um, we're then plotting the reported date ranges site by site. You'll mm -hmm. see what I mean by that in a minute to assess the timing of any post-Roman rat decline. Um, and we're also using data on mice and voles to assess research bias. And for England, at least, we have a similar number of records of those, of each, each of mice and voles, to what we have for rats. Okay. The point being, then, that if we have sites where, if we see that the mice and voles also disappear, then we're probably looking at research bias. If we see that they are not affected in the same way, then the gap in the rat record is more solid. Um, so we have actually, I think this is almost entirely based on the literature. I have actually weeded out some of the English cases via primary research. So visiting archives and actually saying that's not a rat and that kind of thing. Um, so there's been a little bit of checking on the English side, not yet on the Italian side or the Iberian side for this. Actually, no, I did, I did not have one Iberian side for not being a rat. Okay. Um, that's it, out of notes now. So these are the basic results we get for all regions. So England on the left, Italy in the middle, Iberia on the right. I'm not going to say much about Iberia because the data are so thin at the moment as it turns out. So I'm going to focus on the other two places. And we can see that in both cases, we do see a thinning out and even a gap in the record for rats. Each one of these bars is one site phase. Its length is mostly uncertainty. That's worth bearing in mind rather than duration. Okay. A single rat bone in some cases cannot have lasted for several hundred years. It just means we don't know its true date. And that is very important when analysing this stuff. Um, and we see, in England at least, that there is a gap in the fairly narrowly post-Roman period. Um, and I'll put this across here, just based on kind of the, kind of the mid-sixth century line, you know about the precise date, that's so suggesting an play, and it's what was in the original papers, like the height, the, the most deepest part of the late antique Middle Ice Age. Um, but you get the idea that this is something in England which clearly precedes it. Now, there's a slight caveat here, which is that this very flat point on the dating here um, is because typically late Roman English contexts get called late Roman, and then people stick a date on that of either 400 or 410, and actually many of those will be pushing later into the 5th century in reality. I do not, however, think they're going to be pushing into the 6th century. If there's anyone here who's kind of a, a, late, a late Roman, early, early Saxon, archaeologist who wants to argue with me on that, then you probably can. But I think we're probably relatively safe in thinking that things that are dated to late Roman are not going to be pushing into the 6th century, at least not on a regular basis. Um, in any case, we do see this clear pattern. 
Um, but yeah, it's probably not as sudden as it looks on this plot, is my point here. This is quite possibly a more gradual process. Um, now, if you try controlling for research bias, this is the same plot on the left as before, then with mice, and you can't see what the one on the right is because of the little gene spots, but that's voles. All species of voles combined, so they're normally not distinguished in the record, in the, in the reports. And what you can see here is that you do get that same kind of effect, that same kind of step. There is a late Roman thinning out, a post Roman thinning out, but it's not nearly as complete. So the mice in particular here, same number of specimens more or less, but we don't see that gap. Same thing for voles, it's even less pronounced. There is, there is a thinning out, but it's not so profound. And what I think this is saying is that there is indeed a research bias here. We do have less microfauna from post Roman sites for whatever reason, whether the sites are less visible, whether there's less research interest whether they're in places that are having less modern development and they get excavated less, or whether people are less likely to sieve or less likely to actually study and write up and report the microfauna. One way or another, there is a research bias, but it's not enough to explain what we see in the rat data. So there really is a profound shortage of rats in um, early and mid-Saxon, arguably late-Saxon England, over and above the effect of that research bias. Um, unfortunately, this didn't work so well. This is, was a little bit disappointing because it turns out that there is actually more data on rats than on anything else from Italy, at least from the records that Frank Salvadori, my collaborator in Italy, was able to put together. So we do have this much later apparent gap in the rat record, but we cannot 100% say that that's not a research bias because, in fact, most of our data for the other species is coming from those same sites anyway. So when the rats disappear, so do the mice and voles, but those related records are too thin. So I can't say conclusively that this is real, but if there is a drop off and a gap in the Italian data, it is coming considerably later. Okay. Um, for this one, we can fall back on Frank's original paper, where he grouped his sites up into broad blocks and showed that as a percentage of all sites with reported bones of any species, so a lot of this is mostly cattle, sheep, and pigs, and so on, um, there are many fewer having rats in the 7th to 10th century than there are before or after. So again, I suspect this is a real pattern, but I just can't be as concrete about it as I can about England right now. As things say. Um, now, another way of plotting this, this is worth doing, because I mentioned earlier that we have to remember all those bars are not duration, but they're primarily uncertain. Um, so what I've done here is randomized dates from within them. Basically, it's kind of a Monte Carlo approach where for each one of these broad fuzzy lines is a thousand separate lines from a different simulation run of the data. And what this helps to do is take into account that uncertainty um, in a kind of probabilistic way. Um, what we see here, the yellow bar of course being the approximate duration of the first plague pandemic, is that it looks like in England we probably actually have a decline starting somewhat earlier, but by the point that we have um, you know, sites like Edix Hill, by the point we have Edix Hill, we're at the absolute low point of the evidence for rats in the country, which is quite surprising, perhaps, certainly interesting. Um, and then, in fact, that entire low point lasts for basically the entire period of the first plague pandemic, which the end part of this is almost certainly coincidental, but it's um, quite frustrating in some ways. Okay. If you turn to Italy, on the other hand, you see much more what you might expect, which is that actually the um, just in end plague is coming at a point when we have a peak in the amount of evidence for rats, and then we have a drop-off. Now, I should say that I would never say that this kind of drop-off would be driven by something like plague. This is something that's kind of a misconception that pops up occasionally in the literature and in conversations that, you know, plague will result in rats dying off in huge numbers. And it will in the short term, but rats mostly just spend their lives dying anyway, if you see what I mean. Um, and they can eventually bounce back very, very fast. So this could very well be driven by plague indirectly, insofar as it's affecting human populations, human settlement patterns, and so on, the available resources for rats to live on, and the available sites for people to excavate. I don't think you can talk about, I mean, if you have a plague episode, it can dramatically reduce your rat population for a few years. On an archaeological time scale, that's going to be invisible. So we're talking here about indirect effects or unrelated factors, not about kind of the direct impact. The only exception might be if you're looking at places in the north where rats might be wiped out entirely, at a point when there isn't an opportunity for recolonization from other areas. Um, okay, where was I going to go from there? Oh, yeah. I don't trust the end of this data so much yet, because I've really been focusing on trying to shore up, make sure we're relatively comprehensive in the earlier time period, and we may well be missing a lot of data towards the end of this one. 
That's something we'll be working on more in the future. But right now, if we stick a little black death line on here, it's quite interesting. And you actually see the same pattern, which is the decline has already started in England, um, but in Italy, this is happening in a peak. Now, say, big health warning on this. I wouldn't publish this yet. When we publish this paper, we'll probably try and take to 1,000 AD just to be kind of more confident, or maybe 1,200 or something. Um, but I suspect that this is at least partially real, and we'll be looking into this in the future. Could be really quite interesting. So the, I mean, the, the Italian graph here is really fascinating in how it kind of does exactly what you'd expect it to do, but the English one very much doesn't. Okay, so some conclusions from this. Um, for England, the data really supports the idea of a rapid breakdown in the system that supported rats, or the elements of that system that supported rats from the fifth century. They are absent, or at least very scarce, archaeologically invisible, more or less, by the mid-sixth century. In Italy, we have a drop-off starting in the late sixth century, a clear gap in the rat record after about 750 CE, but we can't entirely exclude research or recovery bias for that just yet. Key point for this audience, rats were still very common by the time of the Justinian plague. Uh, for Iberia, the data are very scarce, no clear gap. For people interested in kind of slightly later early medieval, Things, the fact that the numbers really pick up in the 9th, 10th century may be interesting, and that's earlier than they pick back up again in Italy. Um, overall story, though, we, we're seeing regional trajectories rather than a single overarching pattern. The rat distribution in Europe seems to have been already much reduced by 541 CE, and therefore I would caution against one-size-fits-all plague models for looking at the dispersals of the Justinian plague. Now, this does not mean that it didn't have a role in the plague reaching places like England, but it's very hard to explain how it penetrated inland beyond places that shipping with rats associated with them might have got to. Um, we do, however, need more systematic data from other regions, most obviously France, and that's something we'll be working on. So there's a massive gap at the moment for France where I only have quite broad brush data. Um, that's it. A load of acknowledgments. Thank you.